down. But uh, the program has a built-in countdown, which which negates my countdown need. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> now yeah. I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, so am I. So am I. It gets even more confusing when I start blowing things up like this. And it's like, Oh, my Whoa. God. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, anyway, hello, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to VUX World. I'm delighted to, uh, to have you along on the show, Micah, because uh, you've been a tremendous conversational AI activist, I would say, evangelist, I would also say, uh, practitioner and expert, to be honest, over the last few years. Um, been following everything that you've, I know we've spoke quite a few times, been following everything you've been doing online and stuff like that. You produce some very interesting content, always with a nice quirky kind of nature, always very well informed and entertaining. So I'm very, very glad that you can join us on VUX World. So welcome. Thank you so much, Kane. I'm actually a kind of a dumbfounded right now. I'm like, oh gosh, how how can I ever live up to all these accolades? But I'll I'll do my best for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm sure I'm sure you will. I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, so for those for those uh, listeners of VUX World, I'm I'm assuming I'm assuming there's going to be quite a few people who are familiar with yourself, Mike. Uh, um, but perhaps there may be a few people who might not be. So for those that aren't. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what sure. you do and a bit about ConvoCat as well. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, my name is Maaike Groenewegen with, uh, with the nice kind of uh, sound in there. Can you try that, I always, I always struggle with that. Groenewegen. <laughs> it's just like you've got something stuck in your throat. Groenewegen. Oh, that's perfect. That right? yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there you go. Um, well, as my name actually kind of gives away, uh, I don't live in the UK. I live in Hilversum, which is in the middle of the Netherlands. And uh, that's where I work as an independent conversation designer and linguist with my own company, ConvoCat, uh, which I founded in 2019. Uh, actually, yeah, just at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and I've been working as a conversation designer for uh, a number of clients already. I was quite fortunate um, to have a mix of both big corporate um, chatbots that I worked on, smaller startups. I've been doing research for some companies as a linguist. And I'm basically kind of having the time of my life. Um, <laughs> yeah. Before that, I also already uh, kind of had a career as a tech writer. Technical communicator is the official term. And that was basically about writing any kind of information that helped people to complete their jobs, to... Uh, successfully obtain their goals, you know, to complete their tasks. So I was already kind of familiar with helping people, but uh, not so much with chatbots. And, um, well, happy to say that I am now. Um, I live together with uh, Arjan and unfortunately only one more cat. The other one died yesterday. Um, so, yeah, bit of a sad moment, but, um, oh, he had a wonderful life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry to hear that. It's uh, yeah. I, as I was saying before, I can't, I can't imagine losing Winston. So I, I, I appreciate what you might be going through, and appreciate you uh, soldiering up and and doing this uh, mm. and, and, and and coming along. Appreciate it's such it. a pleasure. I mean, of course, the the um, it, it's the other way around as well, right? I really appreciate all the stuff that you bring to the table. A big fan of yours. So uh, yeah, I'm feeling really, really honored to be here. Cool. I like it. I like it. I've got a question uh, which isn't conversation related. We will get on to a bunch of conversation design topics in a moment. I'm going to blow you up while I say this because I want to give people a good view. What's that behind your right shoulder? Behind my right shoulder? It looks It looks a little bit like a, like a bicycle seat <laughs> next to the drum. <laughs> it's my desk bike. Ah. Every, every morning I actually bike to work. So right. I raise my desk, I get up my desk bike, and I ride like three miles to work while sitting at my desk. That is such a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> that is something that I need. I've, I stand most of the time, and I'm realizing that I don't know how good it is for you to just stand all the time. I think you kind of, I don't know if it's good for your feet and for your back and stuff like that. So something like a desk bike you're speaking my highly language. recommended for sure yeah. and it's it's big fun it's if you're a bit of, comp of a competitive person you can actually race yourself wonderful 
<laughs> nice. Uh, usually, the usually the only the only kind of competitive. It's not really competitive, but um, mainly rather than racing myself, I spend most of the time talking to myself, which is uh, <laughs> which is a great habit. Which is a good habit. It's the only way I can get an intelligent conversation in this house. Uh, <laughs> um, so you mentioned there that in a, in, a, in a previous career, you you did have something to do with writing. You were a writer, so. Um, basically if you're tuning in we're, we're going to be talking obviously about conversation design mike has got a whole bunch of uh insight and expertise in conversation design and i'd love to pick your brain a little bit about what you've been learning over the last few years um but you haven't come into this cold then because you've have quite a lot of experience at least with words and with language distilling down information and concepts making them digestible and understandable and so tell us a little bit about what skills you've brought from that world into sure. conversation design? What kind of skills did you already have that you found useful for conversation designers? Um, I think the most important one was actually the, the undying need to ask questions. Questions like why? Why does it work this way? How does it work? Um, why are people having trouble operating a system or executing a procedure? Uh, can I have a look at what you're doing? Um, when I graduated as a linguist, actually, uh, almost 20 years ago, there wasn't a lot of work. Uh, so I ended up on the help desk. And I think that was the most um, informing phase of my career because I literally got people on the phone asking like, yeah, yeah, I want this little picture that makes it work. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? What are you, what are you, what's the problem? Where are you, what are you doing? And in order to actually make sense or make chocolate, as we say in Dutch, of these people <laughs> and what they were trying to do, um, I can actually recommend it to everybody. If you work at a company and they do have a help desk, ask them to spend at least one day a week with them answering uh, customer questions. Or if not, go to your mother-in-law and uh, help her operating her computer or her iPad. That's basically the same. So the ability to actually... Uh, discover someone else's world, someone else's mental model, and uh, writing content that actually connects to their world. So find the starting point where people still understand and work from that uh, in helping them to create new understanding from where they are at that moment. Um, and to do that, um, there are actually techniques out there. Uh, if you Google, for, um, for instance, uh, instruction design or technical communication, minimalism is something I would definitely recommend looking into. These are all uh, content strategies for helping people, supporting them in their task execution. And if you look, for instance, at minimalism, which was a theoretical framework uh, invented by John Carroll and Hans van der Meij in the 70s already, um, they developed a number of heuristics, so guidelines that you can use in creating instructions. Uh, some of them being uh, make sure that your task support is actually anchored in the task domain. So give the help in the context where it's needed. But with a chatbot, of course, that's perfect because it's right there on the screen, assuming that's where you are having the problem. Um, another thing, and this is wonderful, make it action oriented. Make it about the thing that people are trying to do rather than giving all these conceptual information blocks or nuggets. Like uh, this is something I actually see happening in a lot of conversational interfaces. It's a lot about um, what something is like a bank card allows you to do this and this, body, body, body. and I'm like, yeah, sure, but how do I solve my problem? Could you please actually answer my question? Mm -hmm. Especially if you're transferring FAQs to chatbots, that's usually the part that's missing. How on earth do I do it? So mm -hmm. these kind of traditional, if you will, uh, kind of frameworks and expertises can help you a lot with creating great um, dialogues, answers, uh, and solutions. Mm, interesting. And this stuff around minimalist design, instructional design, are these kind of concepts and kind of theoretical models that you've picked up because of that, your previous career? Yeah. Uh, or is it through the linguistics education? 
Um, no, this was actually part of my my journey in crafting a career as a technical writer or a technical communicator. Um, in the UK, I don't know if they still exist because I've been out of the field uh, for quite a long time already, but there used to be the ISTC, uh, which was um, a community for technical communicators. Telecom in Germany is really big. Um, and STC, the Society for Technical Communication, also is a huge community where people work on this and have been working on this for more than 30 years already. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Have you seen any similarities um, with the conversational design community and those kind of communities that have existed in, in prior careers? Or, or if not, yes. what do you think is missing, if, if anything? <laughs> Well, it's something that really strikes me as very similar in both communities is that technical writers, they always complain that no one ever reads their manuals. <laughs> um, chatbot developers always complain that no one ever wants to use them or finds pleasure in using them. And um, this is, of course, not surprising because we're in the same kind of um, bubble, right? We're trying to help people who are usually kind of frustrated already because they've got a problem. Uh, you know, in the in the worst case, they've, they've been robbed abroad on their holiday and found out they tested positive for COVID and also lost their bank card. Mm. And then they get a chatbot that doesn't work <laughs> because it doesn't cover their specific question. Well, no wonder. The other thing is that um, people that are actually helped by our products are not very inclined to give us a lot of praise because, well, they think it's kind of normal. And mm -hmm. it's these little micro interactions that are, if they're seamless, they're seamless, so you don't notice them. Mm -hmm. So we tend to feel a bit of underestimated, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Good design goes unnoticed is the old, uh, exactly. the old adage, isn't it? So exactly. maybe it's a, yeah. an interaction with a chatbot or a, or a voice assistant that is nothing necessarily mind-blowing but it works yeah i mean that's really how it should be once you get comfortable with it the problem at the moment is when you interact with a chatbot or a voice assistant or a voice bot that does a really really good job it kind of at the minute is a really delightful experience because there isn't that kind of consistency with them at the minute exactly and i mean when you're using an apple product um you're not like every time you press a button or swipe something, you're not like, oh, wow, this is so amazing. This is Apple. <laughs> but when it doesn't work, of course, you start complaining. And to be honest, Kane, I must say that if I look at when I started working, my main deliverable were like was a paper manual that was printed and, you know, it was sent along with things like consumer phones, which used to be landlines, because we didn't have mobile phones yet. Yes, I'm that old. <laughs> and if I look at today, I'm like, isn't it like a small miracle that people can actually ask a question? And there's even if it's just a slight chance, there's a chance of them getting the right answer mm. without having to go to a manual or, you know, look up the term in the index, which is incomplete. Um, mm. Mm. <laughs> that that is amazing. That is amazing. I, I can't remember exactly where it was. I think it was. Um, I think it was when a, a few. Quite well, actually, it was a while ago. Now we had on the podcast uh, Ahmed Bouzid, mm -hmm. um, John Kelvey, and Brett Kinsella, and we were debating whether voice first sucks. Was the debate basically? So Ahmed and John had been relatively critical over the promise and versus reality of voice AI and voice assistants. Uh, Brett had been quite kind of praising the progress that had been made and he summarized things in quite a decent way which was putting in context where we are which is regardless of where the technology is and the fact that there may be some poor experiences out there the fact that you can speak to something in 2021 you can just talk and a system technology can just print what you've said and then as you mentioned when it works understand what you've said and respond off the back of that. I think we're in the process of starting to take that for granted, but when you zoom out and you think that you can actually talk to something, yeah. it can understand you and it can respond appropriately to it. Is is mind-blowing if you were to show it to someone in 1950 or 1900. It is, or even in the 80s. I mean, I'll, yeah. uh, after the show, I'll post a, a lyric by, I guess you know him as well, right, Paul Simon. Mm. 
the first song on Graceland, These Are the Days of Miracle and Wonder, this is the long distance call. That was like, you know, the way the camera follows, in, follows us in slow-mo, the way it looks at us all. That's wow. where we are now. And yeah, I can't be, I can't help but being amazed by what's possible. Also a bit frightened sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if, if, you, if you zoom or oh, fast forward, 150 years, uh, it could get quite frightening. <laughs> yeah. And then actually having a piece of paper and a pen or a computer screen and just writing some dialogues is actually really reassuring. I mean, we still have to do it by hand. And at the end of the day, that's not really bad, is it? No, not at all. Not at all. There's a nice bit of craft and a nice bit of creativity uh, and satisfaction that comes with it as well when you can really be involved in the stuff that you're creating. Um, that's wicked. So tell us a little bit then about your linguistic background and how that is helping or or aiding you in your conversation design uh, yeah. career as it is now. Um, well, my, my linguistics background is quite um, broad, but I actually graduated and specialized in sound. Uh, I'm a phonologist by origin. I haven't worked in the field for a very long time. But I've studied the structure of sounds in language. And what I actually, I think the biggest gift from studying linguistics is the skill set, the general skill set that it gives you, because um, it taught me to think on a very kind of abstract, modelmatic uh, way about something that's a very natural phenomenon. Mm. So systems thinking, uh, how things are related to each other, how you can classify information and features and stuff like that. And also sound, if you take, for instance, uh, the infamous term phoneme, <laughs> a sound <laughs> is actually made up of several features. For instance, the, the, the difference between p and b is that with p there's no voice and b you can actually hear my voice kind of making mm -hmm. a little sound. So there's all kinds of different characteristics of sound that you can also classify. And this ability to classify, to apply metadata, if you will, um, is a really useful one to have when you're designing conversational interfaces. Because these two, of course, are made up of little components that you can combine in certain ways, that you can reuse in certain ways. And the ability to view information to view content as a system of components makes it quite easy and a lot of fun to create flows that you can reuse to create master flows and stuff like that so systems thinking is definitely one um, I was also really lucky to actually do some conversation analysis and um, storytelling courses in the UK uh, actually at York University which is uh, still one of my fondest memories of my my studies so I also learned about the nature of conversation and how people use language to sometimes pinpoint precisely what they mean, but sometimes also to hide what they mean. Um, we all know about Paul Grice and his maxims, and mm. especially when you do conversation design, we all assume that we're going to understand each other. Well, that's one mode of conversation, but of course there's so many other modes where people deliberately kind of, you know, uh, cloak the truth or sugarcoat it a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and the awareness of how people use language in certain contexts um, is just such a joy to have, you know, sit in a bus or on a train and just listen to people talking. And you just, my inner conversation analyst is just kind of starting straight away. <laughs> mm, interesting. Yeah. And there's, there's so much more, just a sense of, stylistics for instance actually knowing uh things like like rhetoric uh so stylistic devices to um to to reach the goals that you want because not all content is just for task support sometimes there's like marketing involved as well so how do you uh, persuade people to click the button or to you know uh, respond to your call to action um, there were some really great um, people back in, you know, ancient Greece and Rome that actually had uh, ways for that. Interesting. So, I wanted to I want to ask you a question related to what you were saying there around how some conversations uh, 
people might try to purposefully mask the truth. Mm -hmm. Um, And of course, when we're having a conversation, this conversation right now, there isn't necessarily a specific goal behind it. We're not trying to accomplish a task. We're, we're talking that it goes where it goes. We feed off what each other has said and we use our creativity to then traverse these topics. Um, and when you look at sort of machine learning um, engines or, or rather these kind of like um, examples of things like uh, what's a good example? Um, open AI's uh, GPT three mm-hmm. things like that. There's a few models, isn't there? Uh, the few yeah. that Google just released, where yeah. no. it can kind of pick up conversation, and it can it can um, a bit like the Mitsuku chatbot, for example. Uh, kind ooh, of I think Steve will be quite offended if you say that it's no, not no, like it's, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, no, but Mitsuku doesn't help you accomplish a goal, does it? Mitsuku uh, is there to have general conversations without specific yeah. transactions at the end of them. Yeah. Is that what I mean? <laughs> I love Mitsuku. Uh, he's been yeah. on the podcast. It's fantastic. Um, but what I'm saying is that there are, there are applications of technology that are there to have kind of just general conversations, mm-hmm. entertaining conversations kind yeah. of thing. Um, and we're going to have uh, Ron Ashry uh, from Open Dialogue on the podcast too. And I was speaking to him a while back and he was talking about how machine learning in that respect won't get you all the way uh, because machines don't really understand goals. And not that every conversational chat bar or voice bot has an end goal, mm-hmm. but a lot of them do. Um, and then it got me thinking about... Um, so a conversation that I had uh, we had with uh, Oren Jacob from Polestring before it was acquired by Apple. He was on the podcast and he gave this really good analogy. I will get to the question in a minute, but this is sure, 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 sure. he had this fantastic analogy about what is the point of kind of conversation design? What is it that we're trying to do? And he used this example of when he was working at Pixar, he his team were responsible for creating the technology and then using the technology to create the animations in Pixar films. Yes. So Bugs Life, Toy Story, Finding Nemo, him and his team created all of those animations. And the story he told was that one time he was tasked with creating water for Finding Nemo. So a, an artificial representation of water that needs to be realistic enough to convince someone that it is actually water. So his boss said, I want you to create something and convince me that it's water. So he, he, him and his team created uh, two different videos. One was just a, a normal video of actual flowing water. Another one was an animation of flowing water and put them both in front of his boss and said, which one's real and which one's fake. And fair enough, after some deliberating, his boss did identify the one that was fake. But the point of that whole story is that his end point is when we create conversations, we're not actually trying to literally mimic exact human conversations in the same way as that animation isn't to try and convince someone that it is real. What we're trying to do is take the essence of conversation and use it in such a way that interfaces become easier to use because they're built on top of it. Mm -hmm. So, when you kind of alluded there to sometimes people have conversations and purposefully mask the truth, it kind of got me thinking about what other principles or types of things happen within conversations that we can use and what other things are pointless to discuss, so to speak. So in your opinion, is there any other things like this, any things that happen within the course of a natural conversation, normal conversation that we might not necessarily completely replicate with our conversational interfaces, but that we can use to inspire or to make things easier to use. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, There's three or four that come to mind straight away. Uh, What I actually wanted to say about Cookie is that she's not AI in the turn, in the sense that she doesn't have a large language model. Steve Mm. has actually created her rule based from scratch. That's right. And that's also why Cookie, in my opinion, at least is so much better than Blender or Mina or whoever will ever get because The one thing that Cookie has, and the one thing that I think is crucial for proper human machine conversation is a sense of what we call coherence and cohesion. So does the thing that I say as a whole make sense? And does it make sense in the sequence of what has come before and what will come after? And this is the context, of course, that we talk about all the time, that what should be context sensitive. But even more, they should also be sensitive of what they're referring to in the outside world. 
Um, and the challenge with large language models, if you don't moderate them or don't tweak them or don't curate them by a human, is that after a turn or 20 or 25 turns, they'll tend to get to start making less and less sense until they kind of melt down. Mm. And um, I think that will be solvable in the future, but for now, um, it, it feels like a bit of a limitation of these large language models. Mm. The other thing um, that's something that in linguistics we call dyxis. Um, I don't know how the English pronunciation for it is, but it's the sense of awareness of the agent, of the speaker, of where he or she or they are mm. um, compared to other things in the world. And dyxis is the mechanism that allows you to point. It literally means uh, index finger. So me means that if I point that way, that that's you. Mm. And this is really interesting because as soon as smart speakers get some kind of um, awareness, spatial awareness of where they are, um, that, then things get really interesting because then you can actually say, hey, you, come here, come a bit closer. Yeah, it's all right. Go and sit down. And would you like to hear a story for bedtime? Or you can make something really, you know, if you, are, if you know that your listener is far away, you can shout a bit. And if they're mm -hmm. close, you can whisper. Um, so these kind of mechanisms, uh, I think they will add greatly to uh, conversational experiences that are more enjoyable and possibly also more um, human-like. Uh, there was another one. Ah, <laughs> the assumption that conversation is words. Um, of course, there's a lot of uh, non-verbal stuff going on. Uh, I must say that if I can choose between where is she? Speaking to this black hockey puck, which now serves as a um, paper press, or <laughs> speaking to this little guy, my little pico bot, uh, and if you switch it on, it actually has eyes that uh, blink, and there's a little sensor in its nose, and uh, the the lips actually move. Wow, that's like a whole different world, and it makes me wonder, like. The thing that makes conversational interfaces conversational isn't actually the voice, or might it be something completely different, like the face, or even more uh, eyes. Mm -hmm. because, you know, if we look each other in the eyes, that's where a lot of the communication also happens. Mm. Interesting, interesting. We've got a couple of comments coming through. Sam Danby from Boost AI, uh, previous podcast guest. Please do check that out <laughs> if you haven't already heard that conversation with Sam. He said, uh -huh. I wish I had time to stay for more. Uh, looking forward to watching it back. Please do watch it back, Sam. Grace Hughes says, I'll put this up because this is a good one. Uh, wow, what a mine of knowledge you are, Michael. Oh, <laughs> vega. oh but thank you, Grace. Well, I just heard Grace at the QE conference. Well, she's she's a powerhouse herself so this, this means a lot coming from her thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> and so we are almost kind of getting towards the point where there is spatial awareness in um our devices the mm -hmm. echo show 10 or or i think it's the echo show 10 i can't remember the exact name of the device but essentially it can follow you around the room you know mycroft for a long time has had the ability to recognize when someone looks at the device you know the nvidia uh, jarvis uh, technology has that facial Perhaps. recognition within yeah. there the eye recognition so it knows when you're looking at it and it, the wake word will basically enable and so the devices are kind of getting to that point i've got a conversation about what that means for multimodal design in a moment but before we get to that if we think about the future of these devices richard warzecker from uh is it best buy i think what best buy is uh says that i would think that the voice devices would really be thought of as being in the cloud or remote rather than a kind of hockey puck in a specific spot so i think he's alluding to this ambient future where the technology and computing is all around us versus physical devices with 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 uh you know faces and eyes or whatnot yeah. First of all, before we get on to the multimodal design question, what what are your thoughts at the moment around where the devices themselves are heading, these conversational devices? Is it going to be a proliferation of all of these different things? Some have faces, some have screens, some are just buried in the ceiling, or is it just going to become a point where technology fades into the background and it's just totally ambient? What are your thoughts on, on that? 
Um, well, <laughs> uh, to, to answer that, I think I might, I have to kind of um, point out where I am currently with smart speakers, uh, because for Dutch, we don't get Alexa yet. Uh, we do get Google Assistant, but most of the innovations are actually for the English speaking world. So we, we uh, tend to be, you know, kind of lacking, but that makes us more kind of imaginative, I guess. So one can always dream, right? Um, it's, I, I, I definitely agree with Richard um, that there will be like a voice in the cloud, if you will. Um, but I don't think that will be very much a, of a conversational interface. Uh, it's funny, if I think of a voice in the cloud, immediately I get this Monty Python kind of view, you know, with the cloud and God sitting on the cloud. <laughs> and sometimes I even wonder like, okay, uh, let there be light. Uh, who switched on the light? <laughs> might that have been, you know, we finally know that God might be a woman and, woman and she's called Alexa, right? <laughs> Um, but I think that um, more like command interface voices like uh, switch on the light or things that are not locale or location specific. Um, and these tend to be usually, I think, stuff like operating machines. You don't really need to speak to your coffee maker to get a coffee. So, you know, this probably will be more like the Star Trek. OK, computer, get me a coffee. And whichever device is closest will pick up that command and do what you want. Um, the other stream that I can kind of see emerging is more like the social robotics, uh, where um, conversations are actually a large part of the experience. So mm. these might be your virtual companions or, um, you know, some kind of intermediate form. And as we, we've kind of, we started the conversation talking pretty much about chat often um, and then oh, conversation sorry. more generally. And then we've gone into you know, the whole world essentially as, as conversational mm -hmm. interfaces and what that's going to look like. And now, obviously, as more devices get connected to the internet, more devices inevitably have um, voice interfaces. Uh, then they've got screens now some of them are moving, you know, there's a, then we've got robotics, you know, personalized robots that might sit around your house and do various things for you and designing for those things. It's still essentially rooted in conversation. You said a conversation doesn't have to be verbal or with, or with words mm -hmm. as these things start emerging um, and you need to do, you know, you're not just you're not just designing the conversation as in the dialogue. You're also designing where it looks. Does it look at someone's eyes? You're also designing whether it does this or that. And then with a with a screen, you're designing for you know a visual uh, interface that can also be tapped or swiped. Mm -hmm. uh, with mobile, potentially, you're designing for visual that might aid the user, not necessarily in tapping or swiping, but just communicating different information or more detailed information. And so. The, the world of conversation design in its infancy as it might be already seems as though the future looks quite complex. And I remember a while back we had a conversation about is our things going to get easier where the AI starts to govern more of the design process. And my thoughts were that it's going to get more complex before it gets easier and, and the humans are going to have to design for all of these different interface types. I'm wondering your thoughts on that and the the whole kind of concept of where the multimodality nature of conversation design comes whether you've got any thoughts on on multimodal design yes. conversation design in general yeah um whew, that's that's uh have we got another hour or <laughs> <laughs> um well to start with the well I can't call it easy one, but the, the one that's most tangible, like um, designing multimodal as, you know, voice and screen, that's something I think that is almost inevitable. Um, I, I have a hard time believing that a voice only smart speaker will eventually kind of, you know, make the grade and stay because, I mean, we weren't made to communicate with voice only. I mean, there's a reason we have like so many senses, right? Uh, and adding touch as a sense. I mean, our skin is our largest organ and we hardly ever use it in interacting with our device. Well, of course our phone's swiping a bit, but touch as a an extra mold or layer to your design, if you will. Uh, I, I definitely see a uh, future for that. Um, mm -hmm. 
Mm. But yeah, screen and voice for me kind of go together kind of naturally. Mm. Um, and if I look at, um, I don't, am I allowed to drop names here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, Voice Tech Global, they've got a wonderful course on advanced experience design. So it's not conversation design anymore, it's experience design. Right. And if you, I mean, there's a whole other community of UX designers or visual designers. We don't have to think this up ourselves. We just need to reach out and, and start co-working and co-designing and bring our strengths to the table and combine them. And I mean, yeah, that's... That's almost a no-brainer for me. I haven't done a lot of actual multimodal design yet because, well, I'm not that much in the smart speaker um, mm. uh, world at the moment. But um, uh, in this course, we actually learned a very kind of structured uh, uh, method, a design method to, to tackle these um, design um, yeah, challenges. And I loved it. Mm. Um, uh, my own prototype was for a music teaching uh, app, for instance, where you could switch between visual if you needed things like taps for your guitar or, you know, information on how to hold your instrument. But once you needed to focus or practice for a longer period of time, we switched to voice and audio only uh, with um, um, exercises that actually uh, were based on non-Western music um, teaching tra traditions. So, but the other one, where you go all, all ambient and robots. And to be honest, I mean, again, programming this little guy, uh, you actually have to program the dialogue. You have to program the eye movements. You have to program the blinking. You have to program the mouth. Um, I think it's a matter of, well, I guess, the same thing as we saw in web design, right? Where you started out with your, I don't know, front page. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, basically started to include more and more modalities, video, rich text, rich image, um, until where we are now with um, design uh, systems that are fully integrated on AR and VR platforms. So I guess it's more a matter of finding ways to logically combine compartments, components, modalities, uh, and perhaps develop an overarching design method but this is kind of out of my league, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, we have uh, a, quite a decent question here from Richard, which uh, says, I love the idea of conversing with eyes. Uh, the next, the actual question is, is there already, or do you think there's a need for a unified conversational language that combines those modalities? So something like if you say yes or if you nod, that matches a yes intent. I'd, I'd either add a little bit on to the end of that question, which is around yeah. even if you're not combining those modalities, at the moment, every time you create a chatbot that has a yes intent, you need to create all of the training data for that yes intent unless you've got it somewhere you can bring across. And so there's going to be a whole bunch of areas generally in conversation design. The Coco Hub is doing a half-decent job of trying to get some of those things in play. But I suppose it's a two-part question. One is, um, do you think or can there be this universal kind of intent and training data available? And also, will that extend into multimodal interfaces? That's really interesting. And for these universals, as we call them, I definitely see potential there. Uh, not even just the nodding, but also just saying, uh-huh. Um, so all these kind of paralinguistics aspects. And it's, it's funny, Kane, because you asked me, what has linguistics taught you? And again, here, linguistics is like an interlinked uh, complex of different systems, right? You've got syntax for grammar, you've got phonology for sound, you've got semantics for meaning, and they're all kind of interlinked. So if we can, uh, like Richard suggests, kind of create universal design patterns that interlink speech, gesture, uh, paralinguistic stuff, um, that, that would actually save us having to create and design each component every time again and again, and make reusable components, which is of course what technical communication is also all about. So it all comes together really nicely. <laughs> it sounds like a match made in heaven. Uh, and sometimes I really like, is this really happening? Because yeah, that's <laughs> definitely true. I, I, I just couldn't believe that there was like a place like this 
And I'm, yeah. like, I'm right in the middle of it. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Uh, Grace is exactly what I want to say to my fellow designers. It's not about learning something new necessarily. It's about using your skills and expertise in the service of conversation. I think that's true. I think that designers in general have a, a very good foundational skill set that lends itself really well to conversation design. You just need to pick up the foundations of how to design conversations and, and what it is. I said just, it's obviously easier said than done. It's actually pretty difficult, but designers have a good foundational uh, grasp, I would say. Um, we started treading into some topics here around intense classification and i know that one of the things you mentioned earlier was the 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 thing around how everyone is caught up in in kind of classification and and intent kind of classification stuff like that um and the point that you were asking is how do we make sure that the answers are helpful when we have matched an intent correct and consistent and the thing that i wanted to sort of drill down a bit more on is this concept of correct. How do you know if the answer is correct? Because analytics as good as it is, doesn't always necessarily tell you whether what you've said to the user is exactly what they wanted. And, and is that the answer to their question? Have they left and abandoned because it, it was wrong and they think it's a lot of rubbish or have they left and abandoned because it's right and they think they've got their answer and that's it. So I'm wondering if you can shed any light on that for us. Oh, absolutely. It's, um, there's actually um, there's there's actually several levels of truth in a chatbot and any conversational interface. Um, to start at well, I call it the bottom because it's like at the bottom of my conversational flowchart. It's the actual answers. Are they correct? And to be honest, Kane, I think I spend about sixty percent of my time easily um, just communicating with stakeholders, information owners checking websites and finding out like, hey, you say that the procedure for getting a new account number or registering with your company is this and this and this. But on your website, I read that for that audience, the registration procedure is actually that and that and that. What should it be? And once you're there, um, if you're lucky, you also have a uh, legal department that wants to have a say. <laughs> And of course, being conversational means that you're never complete um, because you're leaving out all the legal stuff that nobody cares about, but which is still really, really important. And I mean, and I'm saying that kind of jokingly, but I've worked in aviation for 14 years. So I take compliance uh, extremely seriously, especially if you're in finance or banking. Um, I always have to realize that what I put in a chatbot is actually kind of, it has a legal status, right? People mm. can um, uh, draw rights from it. Mm. So um, even though this was kind of, you know, lighthearted, this is something we have to deal with. And I'm now saying dealing with, but the, the fun part is that if you involve all your stakeholders in the design process and make them a little bit of a co-owner of your dialogue, uh, by inviting them for design sessions and even let them try a bit of conversation design themselves. Uh, they're actually your biggest supporters once they get it. Because um, once your dialogue is live, they're like, oh, look, hey, hey, I, I, I also built that, right? And they're really proud. So that's one part of truth. Then hopefully this part of truth gets, gets matched with user utterance. Um, and what I do see is an increase in data analysts on conversational teams. Um, I had the big fortune to actually work as a linguist with a team of data analysts, um, and they just spent a lot of time just getting the intent classification right and improving it again and again and again based on all the questions that were, were asked. Um, so I was really fortunate to actually learn a bit about things like K-fold and blind test analysis and do a bit of, um, um, yeah, conversational analysis, metrics analysis myself. Um, and then there's the third part, of course, like, okay, was the answer helpful? And that is where I think that, that, that conversation designers and UX researchers are like a golden team. Because this is not something you cannot get from just data. Um, you really need to get out there with a prototype or, you know, even gorilla testing. Just take your chatbot on an iPad, go into a busy street, put it under the nose of an unsuspecting, you know, uh, uh, 
person there and also would you mind just interacting with this a bit and think out loud hmm. um, because yeah we can do user personas but for for this kind of experience you need other kind of knowledge too you need you need to know how familiar they are with the domain uh, that that you're working in uh, their level of expertise their mental model and this is yeah research mm, interesting yeah i can definitely vouch for user involvement i mean the the the, the difficult thing with um conversation design i find is if you're not used to bringing end users into the equation, if you're not used to doing usability testing, if you're not used to doing user research, then you're flying blind essentially all the time. And the challenge with conversation design, you can design in a team and you can design with others as you should, as in role play and conversations, you know, table reads, understanding how things sound out loud and how things actually progress through a conversation. But you're not an end user. If you're a conversation practitioner, conversation design practitioner within the company or or within a, an, an agency or brand or or a, or a consultancy, you're miles away from the business. Yes. You know, and even if you're a conversation designer within a business, you're not. You don't have anywhere near as much sort of. Um, you're not the same person. Basically, it's it's like it's like doing usability testing on a brand new website with all of your staff. It's yeah. valid to do and and important to do, but it's more important to get feedback from end users and so without that you're almost just designing on your own in a room you may as well just get a pen and paper and do it yourself you're just flying blind you know have you noticed through your experience anything um any other concepts like that definitely involving user research any other kind of like core principles that you just could not live without and you would recommend that any conversation designer just has to do or at least the team working on it just has to do. Yes. Um, what I often notice is that um, beginning teams, they just just start designing. So they'll take their first 10 intents, create great dialogues, and those 10 intents that work pretty all right, then they decide to add another 10 in 10. So you've got 20. And all of a sudden, you'll find the performance of your conversational interface kind of dropping. And you're like, oh, um, hmm, yeah, but the intent that I created here, it might actually be quite the same as the one over there. And the wording is slightly different, but perhaps they mean, this, uh, they mean the same thing. So my advice to any team that just starts out is to start with the end in the back of your mind. Uh, I think this is Kobe. <laughs> but um, um, where, put a little bit of effort, time and research in how you see your conversational interface in one year or two years and how you want to make sure that you're going to be able to scale up. Um, so think about creating a terminology list so that you already teach yourself to use consistent wording for you know, the same kind of concepts so that you don't get confusion about, hey, is this intent about concept A and that about B, or is it actually about the same thing? Um, a really interesting um, thing, I don't, have we got it in English as well? Um, over boeken and betalen, so you can do like a bank transfer or a bank payment, mm. but sometimes yeah. they're synonymous. So when you've got two intents, do they actually mean the same or are they different? Mm -hmm. So kind of modeling a bit of your business domain. Uh, if you don't know how to do it yourself, just get a business analyst. I mean, they should be out there ev everywhere because every big, big company at least has got at least a few of them. Or talk to someone who really knows the, the company. Um, and and try if you can find out what the customer terminology is versus your own internal process terminology. So that at least you kind of disambiguate already at the beginning. Um, and invest in reusability. Uh, if you have a big company and you decide to go for different chatbots for different audiences or for different segments, uh, chances are that many intents can actually be reused. But that's only possible if you maintain them in one place and make sure that they're not slightly different because someone thought, mm, I, I like this, this terminology or this content better. I'll change it here, but I won't change it there. Mm. So internal consistency can help you a lot. 
Interesting. Um, we've got another question from Richard, which is quite good. I don't know if you can hear an ice cream van outside here. It is. Uh, do you know what? I haven't seen an ice cream van or heard an ice cream van for, I would say, the best part of a decade. And uh, I've been back in the northeast as we're moving uh, for about five weeks. And we're not moving here. We're moving elsewhere. But I'm staying in the northeast for a while. And uh, every other day, there's an ice cream van outside. Even when it's pouring down with rain outside, there's this ice cream van that goes outside and pulls up outside. Well, as long <laughs> as it got Capri flakes, and yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you can't get a ninety-nine without a flake. Um, <laughs> so, so Richard's question is um, spot on with the advice about bringing prototypes to real users in real scenarios, and most importantly, making sure that it's on a real device. Any best practices for prototyping or Wizard of Oz testing? Um, uh, yeah, for sure. Um, make sure you've got a testing expert on board. Um, because, I mean, uh, I've done like a lot of informal user testing, but once you get a proper UX researcher slash tester on board, they create scenarios. They, uh, they really know how to set the goals of your test. And I learned so much from him. Louis, thank you. <laughs> so, Shout out to Louis. Uh, yeah, shout out to Louis, definitely. <laughs> um, so just like conversation design is an art, proper testing also is an art. Or, you know, it's it's something that you you should uh, you can learn a lot about. I mean, um, make sure that you you know the goal of your test. What is it that you're going to test? So make sure you describe well, almost like an experiment, right? Describe the variables that you want to test, describe how you implemented them in the bot, and also make sure that you actually have good questions for your, um, your, your audience so that you don't lead them into one or the other solution. Nice. That's just on top of my head, um, a few tips. Nice, thank you. Uh, Sarah is asking for a 99, please. Absolutely. <laughs> On its way. Uh, and I think we've probably got time for, for one more question from Grace. Uh, love the idea of ensuring that the customer terminology is reflected in the conversational user interface, not the system terminology. I've spent the best part of half a decade working with teams in government trying to convince people that you shouldn't be publishing your internal terminology on your website because nobody understands what it means. <laughs> uh, so this is only the same stuff happening time and time again. Now we're just yes. applying it to conversational AI, I think. Um, but, Micah, any other advice on similar things like this, content design research with a conversational twist? Any other things that you can learn from your likes of, you know, content uh, design, content strategy, copywriting, any other things that apply uh, to conversation design? I would definitely invest in researching a proper um, agile release management strategy for your content. Uh, because uh, something that a lot of people tend to forget is the first version of your dialogues. That's not the difficult part. The difficult part is maintaining the thing. And in traditional content, you only had to worry about your website being up to date, and that already is a bit of a challenge. Over here, in a conversational interface, we don't only have content management, we don't only have component management, we also have this new kit on the blog called intent management. So how do you make sure that your intents are still relevant, that the utterances in your intents are still relevant and reflective of what your users actually ask? Um, and also make sure that you um, implement some processes for um, um, emergency updates. Like for instance, if something happens, you don't want to take three weeks to actually train your intent and uh, your bot being able to recognize questions about that. And I think that COVID has taught us so much about that. Uh, the reason why most of my bots have not been NLP bots, NLU bots, but button bots was that they were so much easier to deploy and maintain in terms of um, daily updates from the government. So, and that's another thing. If your content changes daily, consider not putting everything in your bot, but actually referring to a stable source of information outside of your bot. Mm. Um, yeah. That's very good. I love that concept of if, if things change regularly, point to the source of truth is, is uh, I think sometimes we can get caught up on having the conversational AI element be the solver of all problems. And I think that if you look at 
even Amazon Alexa with releasing features that they announced the other week, like send to phone, there's an understanding there that this interface isn't always going to be the be all and end all and do the entire job. And sometimes we need to recognize when to hand off when another type of uh, information type or, or modality is, is better serving that need basically. So I really, really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and Mike, Mike, this has been absolutely fantastic. I've absolutely loved this conversation. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in and for getting involved. Thank you, uh, Richard, Grace, Sarah and Sam for, for keeping the discussion lively and dynamic. Really appreciate it. And most importantly, Micah, thank you so much for doing this. This has been absolutely unbelievable so interesting and uh, yeah. you it was such a pleasure i can't believe time has gone by already i, I, know. I mean, if you ever need like a rerun or something just give me a call because i i had, had a great time thank you 100 percent, 100 percent. there will definitely be a part two because i think we've left a lot on the table uh without a shadow of a doubt where can people reach you online mike i know you're quite active on your likes of linkedin instagram things like that where can people follow you and get more of this uh <laughs> mind-blowing knowledge on conversational ai Oh god! I didn't even start about the community. LinkedIn is definitely my uh, my my homestead. That's where I'm most active. Sixteenth um, of August, uh, Voice Lunch Language and Linguistics will start again, and that's where you can find me together with Brielle Nikolov. Uh, Women in Voice is another community where I hang out regularly, especially with the Dutch chapter. But yeah, go to LinkedIn and uh, shoot me a message. Yeah, would be would be great to get in touch. Fantastic. I'm just making a couple of notes here because I'll stick all of that stuff in the show notes. Uh, Micah, thank you again so much. If you are available in the next hour, and if everyone who's still tuning in is available in the next hour, I'll be joining Colin Barnes of Speechly on uh, Clubhouse. So if you're interested cool. in following up the discussion, then maybe we'll head over there. Uh, switching modalities right now <laughs> there you go <laughs> that's an example of switching modalities yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah thank you very much uh, you. next week on the podcast we have uh, Genesis joining us and we're going to be talking about uh, conversational AI deployments in the contact center. And we also are going to have Balto joining us as well next week. That's Wednesday and Thursday. Balto is an agent assist conversational application. Michael, you might find this interesting, actually. This, is, this one it specifically isn't specifically voice. I think it recognizes the call, listens to the call, and then suggests conversational components to the agent. It looks quite interesting. So, yeah, another two shows for you next week. Uh, and we'll see you, see you there. Michael, thank you very much.